Nowadays, we have the Apple M series, the great ARM CPU lineup that replaced the Core i series, which itself has now been replaced by Intel with some kind of AI boo hawk. And some may remember the PowerPC Max that adorned the early 2000s, but there is a CPU line in between these two that is commonly forgotten about nowadays, and that series is the Core 2 Duo series. Today I have the last of the Core 2 Duo MacBooks, being a 2009 13-inch MacBook Pro, and I know technically that you can get a 2010 13-inch MacBook Pro or the MacBook Air or the MacBook with the Core 2 Duo series, but it's the last year of all MacBooks in the lineup being a Core 2 Duo. So 15 years after the release of this 13-inch MacBook Pro, what can the Core 2 Duo and the rest of the components inside do? We'll, as usual, start off with the specs of the device so we know what we're getting into. My model has the lower spec CPU, being the Core 2 Duo P7550, has a clock speed of 2.26GHz, two cores and two threads, this was before Intel brought back hyper-threading, and has no L3 cache. For RAM, my model has two 4GB 6 of RAM, bringing it up to the maximum supported 8 gigs, although from the factory you could either get it with 2 or 4 gigs of RAM. For the GPU, we have the GeForce 9400M, a GPU that is technically integrated, although it has a separate die from the main CPU, and it has 128 megabytes of system RAM, and is less powerful than a GT210, so we know we're in for some amazing GPU performance. And that GPU is actually powering a 1280 by 800 display. Now while that might not sound great by today's standards, it's 16 by 10, a common selling feature on modern laptops, and the viewing angles and colors of the display really are not bad at all. It's something that I still think is very nice to use and competes with a lot of modern laptops I have. For storage, I have a cheapo 128GB SSD that I bought a couple of years ago to put another laptop in there just so that way we're not tolerating a 15 year old 320 gigabyte hard drive. For ports, we have MagSafe 1, Ethernet, Firewire, Mini DisplayPort, two USB 2.0 ports, an SD card reader, a headphone jack, and an optical drive. Granted, half the ports on this machine don't work because I got it from Goodwill a few years ago for $10, so what are you gonna do about it? And on the topic of broken ports, the video out is one of the ports that's broken on this machine, so throughout this video you will not be seeing screen capture. We're doing it 2010 COD Machinima style. But specs don't mean much on paper. We want to know what this thing is like to actually use 15 years after its initial release. The OS we've gone with today is Linux Mint XFCE Edition. Now I picked this because it's fairly lightweight. It doesn't fight the Novu drivers required to use that very old NVIDIA GPU and it makes firmware installation for the airport Wi-Fi and Bluetooth card in the machine super easy. Starting with the benchmarks, we have web browsing. Now I know web browsing is something that basically any modern PC or phone or tablet can do with absolutely no issues, but this MacBook has a CPU that's less powerful than the one found inside a few year old Samsung smartwatch. So this is something that actually can provide a bit of a challenge for the old machine. If you're just going to simpler websites using Firefox with Adblock, Everything works perfectly fine, it's a reasonably snappy experience. It's not going to be as snappy as a modern computer, but for checking old forum posts or just browsing Reddit, it's going to be perfectly fine and not get into your way. Some heavier websites can pose more of a challenge for the machine, and by heavy websites, I am mainly talking about YouTube here just because of how heavy it's gotten over the past couple years. And because this MacBook has a very old GPU in it, there is no VP8 or VP9 GPU video decoding uh, support. So if you want to watch YouTube videos on this, I would highly recommend using the H.264 Fi extension that you can get on either Firefox or Chrome based browsers. Using that extension, you can totally get away with watching simpler 1080p YouTube videos on it with no issues, and the speakers found inside this machine make it a pretty decent video watch experience. But this is a laptop, and portability is a concern, so while doing tasks like web browsing and video watching, what's battery life like? Now keep in mind, I did actually replace the battery in my machine last year with an aftermarket battery, bringing it up to nearly full capacity. And while watching a YouTube video, you can reasonably expect to see about an hour and a half of battery life, and if you're just doing more simple web browsing tasks, you're looking at two to three hours. So battery life is not the strength of this machine. There are plenty of things that people do outside of the web browser on their machines. And one of the things that interested me most with this MacBook was the fact it still had a combo CD DVD drive. So I went ahead and put in a DVD to see what happened and VLC picked up with no issues. Now while watching the DVD did not pose issues, the laptop actually didn't want to spit it out in this case. So I had to hold the laptop sideways 
tap on the side and press eject in order for the laptop to actually shoot out the DVD. But with a replacement DVD drive or a machine with less wear on it, it would not be an issue. But even given the difficulty I had with getting the DVD out of this machine, I still think the optical drive is one of the best use cases for a MacBook of this vintage. Given that the unibody series of MacBooks is still very upgradable, you can actually put in a Blu-ray drive, although Blu-ray on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux can actually be a pain to get working. If you get one of the 15 or 17 inch unibody MacBooks, you actually get an even nicer screen with better speakers. I think those will work super great as a optical media viewing machine. Another great use case for all unibody MacBooks, including this one, would be using it as kind of a janky stereo receiver in a bedroom setup or maybe a home office setup. The USB ports mean you can easily have USB audio out. You still have a headphone jack on this machine and it has an IR receiver on the front, meaning that you can use a remote for it and control it from across the room. As for something besides media consumption, one of the things I tried outside the web browser was just writing a C++ Hello World program and compiling it on the machine. Now this is a task absolutely no computer nowadays should struggle with, and this machine had no issues at all, plus the relatively nice keyboard made the experience very good. And of course, that good keyboard means that if you use something like OpenOffice or maybe an older copy of Microsoft Office, if you're using Windows 10 or an old version of Mac OS on this, it will work great as an office machine as long as you're not going to be away from power for too long. But forget about normal use cases you might actually want to do. I want to know what it's like to game on this machine. And it'll be extra fun seeing if a GPU with a double digit CUDA core count can play any games at all. So my test suite consists of the original Half-Life and Portal 2. What, did you expect Cyberpunk to run on this thing? Come on. Starting with the original Half-Life, playing at high settings at the screen's native resolution, we saw anywhere from 25 to 40 FPS, which isn't great, but you could turn it down if you wanted a smoother experience, and it was totally playable on the machine. Plus, in this case, we're using open source drivers, because if you want to use the actual OEM drivers, you have to roll back to older versions of Linux programs like X Server, so we are seeing a bit of a downgrade in performance compared to what the GPU is actually capable of. And then testing Portal 2, we used the lowest settings at the screen's native resolution, and we saw, in a kind of middle of the game test chamber, anywhere from 15 to 30 FPS. Once again, not great, but that game came out a couple years after the laptop was released, and this laptop was never designed with sheer horsepower in mind. This was meant to be the portable pro laptop, so seeing those results is not bad at all. I'm sure some people are interested in some more canned benchmarks that can be compared to other machines, so with Geekbench 6, we got a single core score of 312 and a multi core score of 524. And then for a web browser test, I decided to use Octane 2.0, which this laptop scored. 10,004. And for reference, my main PC, which rocks a Ryzen 5 5600, scored about 40,000 points in the same test. And my main PC got that score while there was a YouTube video playing in the background and Steam was updating games, so it was far from the highest score possible. And while I would like to include a more definitive GPU benchmark, the gaming is all we have just because the Novu drivers prevent us from really seeing what the GPU is capable of. Just know that in terms of raw power, it is less powerful than a GT210. So is there a reason to own a 2009 MacBook Pro in the year 2024? Actually, depending on your use case, yeah, totally. In terms of a multimedia consumption machine, it works great. It's really only beat out by that weird, like, 21-inch Dell Luggable made in the mid-thousands. The unibody line of MacBooks was also the last line to have native Firewire support, which can be required if you're doing things with older iPods. And of course, if you just want to do office work or simpler programming work, these have a great keyboard which can totally be used as long as you're staying close to an outlet. And if we're talking about unibody MacBooks as a whole, if you're using anything that's still Core 2 Duo, I would really recommend running Linux on them. Although, you can use OpenCore Legacy Patcher to install newer versions of macOS, and I would highly recommend doing that if you have a 2011 or 2012 MacBook Pro. So if you find a good deal on these machines, I think they are totally worth spending anywhere from $10 to $50 on, even in 2024. If you enjoyed this video, you may also enjoy the end card, which is a review of the first-gen iPhone SE I did about a month ago, and I'm sorry for the late upload on this video. I'm trying to get them out more consistently. I just have been sick twice since the last video and had final season. Season, but we should have more videos going in the future. Also, let me know if you like the slightly different style of this video. I wanted to try something new and see how it would go over. Also, if you have any other video ideas you'd like to see in the future, leave a comment because I'd love to read them. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing as it helps more people find the channel and random tech videos are what I do here. Now, I'm Jackson the Nerd and I'll see y'all for the next one, hopefully within the next month.